things already present in Froom, and what they needed more than something new in the mix was promotion and then a kind of cohesive, uh, something that brought them all together in a sense that actually painted the picture of them as an economy, not just as individual projects. So, so that, was, that was our initial event back in November last year. Next slide, please. So flash forward um, sort of eight months later, um, I think a really core kind of outcome that, that, that we've managed to create or start to create, so this, this is the leaflet, I'll move, get onto that in a moment, but what we wanted to put forward was this idea that Froome can have its own vision for a circular economy. So the, the, the broader idea of what a circular economy is from a technical standpoint, um, which is in essence to eliminate waste and pollution, protect nature and keep resources cycling um, at the local level. And that's kind of the, 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 the broader systemic idea, but what we wanted to kind of put across is Froome's circular economy can be unique and it needs to be a reflection of Froome itself. Um, so when we were doing this project, uh, and you can see it within, in the leaflets that are on uh, some of the tables, uh, we split it into five broad categories. Um, so those broad categories were growing, sharing, repairing, reusing, and reimagining. Um, so they're all somewhat uh, self-explanatory. Um, so growing obviously is just quite fundamental to any community. We thought felt it was important that that got enough attention. Um, so there's growing. Uh, obviously you all know what sharing is. Um, don't need me to explain that, but sharing beyond kind of uh, Sesame Street values, um, there's something kind of deeper and more profound as to what sharing can actually bring to a community. Um, now, I don't know the, the, the details of this, but I have a friend who works um, in this field um, of what's known as the gift economy. Um, so she works with uh, indigenous communities around the world, specifically communities where their, their whole economic basis is based on sharing, essentially. No exchange of money. There's no, if something needs something, it's given to them. So if someone has something, they give it to the person who needs it, and their whole economy operates like that. Now, I'm not saying we should do that. <laughs> um, but it's interesting that you know that can be an aspect of Froome's economy, and we, we're already starting to do that. We have the share boxes and the share shop, and there's kind of you know, the, the, the use of the word sharing. You know, it's it's starting to 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 be more and more present. But it's just that idea that actually economies can be quite radically different from from what we're currently doing. Um, so yeah, within sharing is also this idea of the gift economy. Um, obviously, with repairing. Um, so that's trying to encourage people to move away from the kind of throwaway cult culture that we've kind of ended up with, and returning kind of to the way like our grandparents and great parents would have done things, which is just don't throw it away, fix it, <laughs> uh, in essence. Uh, reusing is, is, is the next section. Um, similar to repairing in a sense, but, but what's encapsulated with reusing things is this idea of upcycling. Um, so a really amazing business that we featured in our organization that's in the leaflet is called the Scaff Shop in Froome. Um, and they take reclaimed scaffold boards um, and turn them into like beautiful, functional, kind of sleek office items and um, furniture, essentially. Um, but yeah, they're fantastic. Uh, and then finally, the one that really kind of, that I pushed for and, and, and think is essential is this idea of reimagining. Um, and it's this aspect that we're bringing in that I think could make Froome's circular economy or the, the, the vision that we eventually kind of co-create co for an alternative economy together. I think reimagining is really special because it, it opens up the idea of what a resource actually is. Um, you know, any act of change is an act of imagining. You know, all of the, the, the four previous ones require creativity, require imagination. So I think what we were trying to communicate with this is recognizing that imagination is in fact a resource and you could argue that it's the most primary resource that we have. Um, you know, moving into kind of an ever increasing world of complexity and the, the, the multiple crises that we are faced with, whether it's the environmental crisis or the cost of living crisis, you know, you name it, we require creative thinking to kind of be like, how can our systems be better? How can our services be better? How can this community uh, work together in a more complete way. Um, so that's what reimagining is trying to incorporate, and you, you can see some of the examples in the leaflet. And one that isn't in the leaflet that I really love is the good heart. You know, an example of, of you know kindness, the well-being economy. You know, that's an example of completely reimagining. You know, what if we had an economy of based on kindness and based on well-being? Um, so that's that's those five broad categories that that we've put forward that are by no means fixed, but just the, the, the start to something. Um, 
So we produced 10,000 beautiful leaflets, as you can see, all on recycled paper. Um, so that's that one, and it's it's on the uh, the tables as well. So so that was that was one of the outcomes that went to the majority of houses in Froome and was distributed by the Froome Times. The directory on the Froome Town site as well. And then finally, next slide, please, Laura. There we are. Um, so that's our back. So that's our magnificent banner, um, which is down at Badcocks. Um, that's what it is. Um, I think it's really great. I've had loads of positive, fe positive feedback from people. It really brightens up that space. Um, but yeah, I mean, in regards to this banner, obviously it's kind of it's, it's cool and it's interesting and it helps helps promote the project. Um, but I think the kind of the, the the slightly deeper reasons for why we've added this up there. Um, you know, it's an in incredibly visible place, and you know, I think the artwork itself is quite impactful. And artwork like that, at that scale, does have an impact on people. Uh, you know, it gets them asking questions. You know, what is that? Why is that there? You know, following the link. Okay, you're starting to understand the circular economy. And in essence, I think what it's doing is, you know, it's in such a visible place that everyone is is, is seeing this image and this symbol, and it's kind of creating a shared experience in the town. Um, and the reason why this is important, and I will read this from the paper, or why, so why I think this is important, uh, is to create lasting systemic change in Froome. We don't only require new initiatives and systems, although this is essential. We also need Froome residents to have a shared understanding of things like circular economy, as well as, as, well as a sense of pride, ownership, and active participation. Through this, our collective awareness as a town around issues like regenerative economics will strengthen and can in time become the norm. So I think that's what this could do, perhaps, <laughs> other than it just being quite lovely. So that's that. Uh, and then finally, what's next for Keep It Froome? Um, so we hope to use what we've done as a platform to build upon Froome's circular economy. Um, we hope to continue to tell the story uh, of Froome's circular economy and generate real ways in which people can participate in that. Um, we've got talks with the ship pub to have a permanent mural of, of this image on their wall, so that's quite exciting. And then some other interesting things like potentially a circular pop-up shop in one of the banks and maybe a shared online platform for people to circulate resources locally. So there's a whole plethora of things that we're looking into doing to build on the work that we've already done. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Ben. That was really illuminating. Um, we had this as an extra adjunct to this evening's meeting, so we could do the formal stuff without Ben having to opt out of the meeting. Um, and before we start the meeting proper, I just have... Oh, any questions? Yes, of course, any questions? Does anyone have any, any questions for Ben? You were obviously very thorough and clear. Thank you. Um, so thanks for coming tonight. This is a meeting of Froome Town Council. I'm clearly not Philip Campagna. It says here that I am, uh, but I'm not. But I'm very happy to be here again this evening and chairing this evening's meeting. Just to remind everyone, we have people online as well as here in the room. For those of us here in the room, some very basic housekeeping. Emergency exit is there. Uh, the assembly point is in the far side of the car park. The toilets are at the end of the corridor on this floor, and there's an accessible toilet to the right of the lift out there tea, coffee and water over in the corner if you're feeling parched because it's quite hot. Parking. Laura, Sarah and Rachel are managing the minutes and the question board and the IT generally. We are being recorded and we're being live streamed and Becca as well is helping out tonight. Thank you, Becca. Um, for anyone attending via Zoom, can you please use your yellow hand to suggest that you have a question? And for everyone who's not on Zoom, just use your actual hand. Um, and we have some apologies for absence. Oh, okay. No one proposed me to be chair in the meeting, so can someone do that? Lisa, thanks. Seconded by Mark, thanks. Everyone okay with that? Carried by... Polly! <laughs> yeah. That's great. Everyone's happy. Um, thank you. Apologies from Carla, Philip, Anita, Andy, Nick, and Mel. 
Um, so all that's recorded, and I think that's it before we can start, is it? Someone propose that we accept those apologies. Can someone propose we accept those apologies? Thanks, Anne. Can someone second that? Polly, thank you. Can everyone agree that that's okay? Unanimous. That's unanimous. Brilliant. So moving on then from Ben's lovely talk, we're going to have a presentation from Keep It Froom. Yes, that, that was the Keep It Froom presentation. <laughs> Can you do it again, please? But no. So moving on, we are on to questions and comments, uh, approval of the minutes from the last meeting of the 17th of May, 2023. Are there any questions about those minutes, Fiona? Okay, pretty. <laughs> Can someone suggest that we accept those? Thank you, Lisa. Seconded by Steve. Everyone okay with that? Brilliant. Any declarations of interest? No, we're good there too. Um, so we are on to question, uh, uh, agenda item three already. That's questions and comments from the public and councillors, including Somerset councillors. And Dawn, it's nice to see you here. Do you have a update or a little report for us? So you got my report, so I'm not really going to um, talk much about anything else. But if you can support Froom uh, Chamber of Commerce, they're running an event in July with the Somerset Chamber at Standerwick Market, so it'd be great if you wanted to go to the business breakfast and just support small business. And then I just have two questions. Um, one is about um, the dogs on the leads or not in Victoria Park. It feels like some people are and some people aren't. And I thought the rules were from eight till six in the summer months, the dogs were on leads, but people are just doing their own thing. So I was just curious about that. And then the other thing I just wanted to find out about the Tourist Information Centre and what's happening with that, because I believe there's some changes ahead. Right, right up there. Um, I'm sure Rachel will be able to cover the uh, point. The rules haven't changed in Victoria Park, but it sounds that we need to re-emphasise them. That, Yep, and you're doing the Victoria, the, the TIC one. Oh, uh, yeah, but also just to update that we have just redone the signs in Victoria Park around the dog, um, uh, dogs on leads. I think it's 10 o'clock until 6.30. So in the morning, dogs were allowed off lead because I think that was a conversation that was had with the dog walkers at the time. And then hopefully in prime picnic time, dogs are definitely on the leads, but we have just redone the signs and hopefully they should have gone up. Well, I think they went up last week, but I can check that for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you've got until 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, just to add, I asked Rob about this because I a similar thing. They have just gone up. So the signs have just been renewed, um, but they were not very visible before then. So I think that's when there was quite a number of incidents or a few incidents. And first, then Lisa. Um, it's not about dog walking, it's a separate question. We'll come back to it then. Lisa. Uh, just with regards to the dog walking, as the signs have just been up, can we put something out on social media? Yeah, of course. Like maybe a dog eating a ham sandwich in a park? <laughs> I can't. I mean, normally we, yeah. We on a skateboard. <laughs> yeah. And my, my question is, is, is probably for Dawn because you're here from Somerset Council. Um, uh, I went to the SANG meeting, Fairfream SANG meeting, the service users networking group. I can never remember what SANG stands for. But a topic that came up was with the move to the Somerset Unitary Authority, there seems to be some difference in the way council tax is discounted. Um, so some legacy benefits that used to allow people to get a discount of 80% and now not allowing people to get the 100% discount that, that Somerset is giving. So some people are losing out in that. And I know it will all settle down, but at the moment there are a lot of people in great difficulty with council tax. 
Thank you. Uh, what I'll, I'll do is I'll investigate that and I'll get back to you, Anne, because I'm not quite sure. I thought it was supposed to be 100% and that was going to kick in straight away in April, but that hasn't. So. Well, uh, well, I, th I think it, it may have kicked in at 100% for some people on some benefits, okay. but not all of the benefits that people used to get a discount for with Mendip, they're, are they getting that discount with Somerset? Lovely. Thank you. I'll sort that. Can we minute that so there's an answer at the as soon as we possibly can. I'll come back to you, Sir Rachel. Um, yes, just to answer your question about the TIC. Um, yes, changes are afoot. Black Swan have decided that um, they are going to have the round tower back and use it for a different... Um, well, they're not quite sure what they're using it for, but they've given us notice until um, the end of August. So uh, we've been looking along with the volunteers around what options we have um, and where we can go, where we might place. So we're still in the process of looking at that at the moment. Of, um, once we have some firm answers, then we will uh, put some suggestions into the ring and then I'm assuming we'll bring them back here for councillor council approval. There's some lively debate. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, there are, certainly the volunteers have lots of good ideas and are, um, you know, really helping us pursue those and work up the case for, for you know, different positions around the town. Thanks, Rachel. I'm going to go to the gentleman behind you first. Yeah, Julian, yeah. Um, you need meadow the other day and this is following on from victoria park dogs are uh, galloping through uh, rodden meadow all the time so i don't know whether they're allowed to or not they're off their leads but the, the the concern that i had and i wrote an email to friends of the river Froome, but it got bounced back obviously their email box is full um but um there was a group of young people having a barbecue uh, in rotten meadow uh, last week uh, and uh, the next day I went back and there were two large burn holes in the meadow. I don't know if that is of any interest to the town council and have they got any ideas about that? It absolutely is because it's not on, it's not allowed and it's very destructive and I don't know what our position, I know our position is that it's not allowed but Rachel I'm sure you'll be able to illuminate us a bit on how we can enforce that or... Well, or uh, only to say that from a commons perspective we're encouraging people to um, have fires in the in the fire pit um rather than throughout the meadow so and again um, the, as much comms as we can do on that the better lisa hang on fiona first then lisa um, if, if, if someone wants to come back on that point then please go I'm just wondering um, for the general public if we could just be clear about where those fire pits are. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think your microphone is turned on. But. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. What do we do? Yeah. I mean, there, there, there are fire pit areas which we try to encourage people to use. Um, and there's undoubtedly a fire risk about random, particularly in this weather, uh, sort of random barbecues being lit. Uh, the, the, the challenge we have, other than putting signage up that will be removed just through a, a vandalism point of view, is, is policing that and enforcing it. It's um, what we we do try to put the signs up and they're very regularly taken down and we keep replacing them. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a tough job to enforce that kind of thing, but you're absolutely right, it's not on. And I think in a way it's on all of us to kind of tackle it when we see it. I know it's hard, I've been there myself and I've seen people having fires and I haven't wanted to go and say, but I think we kind of have to, don't we, Rach? Um, just to say there's a question from Lenka online. Lenka yeah. online. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, cool. Um, basically, uh, actually, Anne, Anne, I came to the meeting, but Anne Hills has actually already raised the issue. So now I'm glad she has, and I'm just reiterating, that's why I joined. Um, so Dawn, if you could possibly um, email Fairframe regarding the matter of the council tax. 
um, because we it's affecting some people. They've had a 40 percent increase in their council tax. So it's obviously affecting a lot of people. So um, can that be ministered, please, as well? Yeah, we got that. Lenka, yeah. Rachel, did you want to say something else? No, Fiona. Um, yeah, I just wanted to highlight that obviously we're, well, we are in the middle of Great Big Green Week. There's lots of amazing activities going on. And thank you to all the staff who are involved in kind of pulling that together. Um, Rachel and the comms team and then Nikki and the resilience team. And also just to give everyone a heads up that we are having what will hopefully be quite a good meeting around the town's response to the climate crisis and biodiversity um, breakdown on the 19th of July at the football club starting at 630 light food light meal will be provided as i've just read um if you need any extra um enticement to come along um but yeah be lovely to see as many people there as possible everyone is invited and yeah it's looking at what all of us are doing across the town to tackle the climate emergency thank you any other questions or comments from councillors or staff or residents okay that's brilliant um moving swiftly through max you might have been more on target than you thought agenda item number four the process for community grants uh 2023 24 and i believe that's lisa to talk on this one is everybody okay if i'm here presenting it rather than up at the podium um this is a, a recommendation to move the grants group into a committee um we met as a group oh about three weeks ago um, and looked at the process and felt it would be better served by being a committee open to the public, um, inviting those who are applying for funding to come in, discuss it, um, and being open and transparent about the process by which we select people to give grants to. That sounds very good. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I believe there are two recommendations with this. Does anybody have any questions? Um, the it's just it's more about the wording. But if ever if other people are going to pull me up, I'll put I'll pull myself up. Um, it's just more about the wording than anything. The bit around um, organisations making non political and non profit making individuals will not be funded. I think that we do, but I think one of the most powerful things we can do is pay people who are doing amazing work to do amazing work. So I don't know whether we just want to clarify that bit I'm presuming it means that that people can put in for the cost of their time but maybe we could sort of clarify the wording on that bit a bit more and make it clear because I think it's really important that people feel that they can put in for the cost of their time perhaps even suggesting a certain you know amount per hour or something that is kind of applicable for a community thing um, as a sort of guide and just make it really clear because I just think it's really important that we are I think we should be funding people are you happy to to work on that language with me, Fiona? Or someone from the grants committee, but otherwise, I mean, I'm happy to, but it probably is more appropriate yeah. if it's someone from the grants committee. You're good with words. As a starting yeah, sure. point, why don't you, you go. have a chat about where that's going to go and yeah. we'll go from there. Um, okay. Perfect. Should we look at the recommendations? Oh, sorry, Max. I don't think we can pay people. Put in, surely we can put in for the cost of someone's time. Oh, yeah, so that's yeah. different. So I thought you were talking about giving grants yeah. to individuals. No, okay. I, I, but because we say we don't give grants to individuals, I think it makes it a bit unclear as to whether people could put in for the cost of their time. And I'm saying we should make it clear that they can do that. Yeah. Within, within, within we should, the like, projects. Pardon? Within the projects. Within the projects. I'm not saying we should be like, you know, like Joe can put in and be like, I need £500 to repair my roof. I'm not saying that. Like, no, I'm you'd always pay people, you would always people, pay people through... Yes. The organisation. Yeah, through the funding process. Just the language, I think, is yeah. unclear. That's what I'm getting at. Both happy with that? We can take that. Okay. Okay, Max? So for the, do I say the recommendations? Okay. Two recommendations on this. Uh, one, for the council to give the creation of a new grants committee. And two, for the mayor, Philip Campania, to be the chair. Um, we have discussed this with him. He is aware of this. We are not stitching him oh, up here. What a shame. We shouldn't have told him. We'll take these as one. We'll take this as one recommendation to vote on. So can I can have a proposer, Fiona, and a seconder, Steve, and everyone in favour. Yep, it is. 
Yeah, I, I just want to make sure we've got a minute right to, to make sure we're going to commend some of the terms and conditions. So is terms and conditions, uh, at what point, Fiona, you're just questioning that we just to talk about? Give me a sec. Or F on the terms of conditions. Just It's just that line, individuals not be funded, I just think gives the wrong impression. Okay, so it's in four F on the terms. That, that's really good. So, so we can put a sort of agreed subject to minor amendments to 4F, that's I just want to make the minute correct. Yes, go ahead. That's a question I should have asked a second ago. Um, you're saying the chair being the mayor, is that the chair being the mayor every year, whoever the mayor is, or that just this year will be the mayor who is Philip Campagna? Is the chair of the committee always going to be the mayor or is it going to be? We are recommending that it is the mayor going whoever forward. That may be every year. Yeah. Yep. Fine. Yep. I think that really makes sense because the mayor is so involved in making those decisions anyway. So it, I think it's it, it makes sense as a as a as a process. Everyone okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Any more questions on that? Stop giggling, Steve. <laughs> okay. So agenda item five. An update on the programme in the council plan on reducing poverty, including the refugee help and community building in the town. I think, Anne, you're going to start with this one. I, I'm going to start and then very quickly hand over. I've got a very few slides, so I am going to stand up here. Um, you will all have read the paper, but just in case you haven't, or just as a reminder of what you were, will have read within the paper, um, the paper talks about really the approach that Froome Town Council has taken over a number of years in community development and this is looking particularly at two strands of deprivation the 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 acute problem of the cost of living crisis but also the chronic problem of um, de deprivation within the town um, we we have made steps to tackle the cost of living crisis and we'll see, see in the table there are some actions that we've marked as green because we've come we feel we've completed them there are other actions that are ongoing um, to do with the cost of living crisis but also the chronic problem of deprivation we haven't fixed that <laughs> we probably will never be able to fix that but the steps that we are taking to work towards um improving that, that those circumstances are obviously ongoing so two strands um the way we have been working as a town council as a convener a facilitator um, an enabler of community groups and individuals within the town helping people to help themselves um, so working with voluntary groups community groups faith groups social enterprise groups within the town, um, a process of facilitation and enabling. Next slide, please. So the first step was to map existing um, assets within the town, existing services within the town, who's doing what in this space, where are the gaps, are there any gaps, who would be best placed to fill those gaps, can we encourage a community group to fill that gap? How are, how are they um, resourced in order to fill that gap? Are there additional services, facilities that we need to commission or encourage a community group to take on? So that's the mapping exercise. So coordinating, facilitate, facilitating the filling of those gaps. Um, the, the whole thrust of our work is to stop our residents reaching crisis point. Um, Kate, in the past, Kate Hellard has talked about the idea of sheep falling in the river upstream um, and someone pulling them out of the river downstream rather than us constantly pulling sheep out of the river downstream it's much better to fix the fence upstream and stop the sheep falling in the river that's the analogy okay so we're we're working before 
the residents of Froome reach crisis point rather than fixing the problem, which is so much more difficult to fix once they've reached crisis point. Um, there was a, a huge amount of learning from the COVID pandemic. We have a very agile town council. So we were able to pivot their work at, at the beginning of lockdown in order to be able to to serve the residents of Froome and and help them through that process and our learnings from the work that we did during the COVID pandemic are applicable to the cost of living crisis so all of our learnings from each new emergency that arises um, assists us in our community development work um, so lots of learnings from the COVID pandemic. Um, we were able to de deliver projects to support residents to, to mitigate the impact, impacts of the cost of living crisis. So take the learnings from that and apply them to the cost of living crisis and whatever next crisis comes along to hit us. Next slide, please. Um, we, we work with our community um, rather than doing things to the residents of Froome or even for the residents of Froome. It's much better if we do things with the residents of Froome. If eventually, if we can enable the residents, residents of Froome to do that work for themselves, then we can make us all redundant and we can all go home. Um, so we look at what assets there are in the town and we're not just talking about physical assets we're talking about people and relationships and community groups um, and those are the assets within the town um, all with the um, with the idea that we're encouraging um, our, our residents to be more resilient against whatever crisis next comes along um, and now I'm going to hand over to Nikki. No, I'm going to hand over to Hannah, who's going to talk about some of the work that she's been doing in. Oh, if we go back through the, the chart, this is what I was talking about. Some of the items, it's in the paper, but there's the, the table of the strands of work, the items that we feel have been completed um, so marked as green and the yellow ones that are, are still ongoing. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Hannah, but I'll be back to answer questions or deflect questions to other people in a moment. Hello, can I stay here? Yes. Great. Yes. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so if you don't know me I think everybody knows me maybe not Julia <laughs> I'm a project officer in the communities team and so I support um, all community building activity in Froome particularly on the street and neighborhood level um, and as Anne said using a strengths-based and participatory approach where it's appropriate so essentially it's that bottom up rather than top down um, thinking about you know how can we know what's important to people if we haven't listened um, and how can meaningful desired change happen if it isn't rooted in the community in the first place. Um, so the work I've been doing in St. John's um, was an opportunity to work in an area that we didn't already know much about. Um, for whatever reason, we hadn't heard from any neighborhood groups in the area and there was no obvious community events happening. Um, and it was hard to tell if people there have a sense of agency and connection, whether they want one. Um, so this work also came about as the cost of living crisis was hitting um, and the available data also told us that there were struggles for people here in terms of poverty and other vulnerabilities. Um, I think, next slide. So yes, so with any engagement in any of our areas of work, it's important to be asking the right questions. And these are the ones that I task myself with discovering in this neighborhood. Um, and so you'll notice that they're rooted in a strengths-based approach. So rather than what's wrong, it's what's strong here in the first place, not what's missing, what's here, what's, what are you working with? What have you got here already? Um, and avoiding that, what can we do for you? It's, you know, what do you want to do? And do you need anything to help make that happen? Um, what do you love here? That was the first screen with the 
board that we did at one of the events. Um, and the next slide, are some of the examples of the things that I, we did. Um, so it's important to use a variety of different things. So to get a range of voices, people, you can't really do one or two things because not everybody will come to your event or, you know, um, uh, there's, there's positives and negatives to each of these. Door knocking's great, but it's really time consuming. Um, I think I've knocked on every door in St. John's <laughs> and had some really valuable conversations, not with every door, because <laughs> not, not all of them opened, obviously, <laughs> but, the, um, uh, but I've had some really valuable in-depth conversations with people that would never have come to anything that, you know, I would have put on. Um, and, and also signposted those who wanted to, to be involved. Um, and bus stops are a good captive audience. <laughs> so they're waiting for their bus. Um, and then it's also, it's good to try things. So I started a coffee morning in the football club thinking it would be a great place, you know, in a neighborhood that was lacking a community space for people to come to, but it didn't end up being appropriate for that particular neighborhood. Like it's got a much more broader reach as a venue. Um, so I knocked it on the head, but it was worth a try. Um, and then engaging with the other stakeholders in the area was really important. And I found it really beneficial in this area for lots of reasons. Um, so there are shop owners, um, social housing officers and the football club. Um, and as we got to know the people in the area that kind of became clear that the shops um, on the Rodden Road end of the neighborhood, I should have put a map on it anyway, but um, there, they're a kind of pseudo community hub for the people that live there. So there's a corner shop, a barber, a chip shop and a beauty salon. And everyone who owns those businesses and works there have got really good relationships with the people that live there. There's like a noticeable affection and support between them. Um, there's loads of small examples, but one when, when Nikki and I were there last week, Sam at the shop was just on his way to go and visit one of the regular customers of his because they'd had a bereavement in the family. And, you know, you could see that that was there was a strong network there. Um, and because I spent time building relationships with them, that meant that they were happy to have me there and, and able to kind of promote what we were doing to the people that, that trust them and know them well too. Um, so we had a great turnout. We did a pop-up event outside the chip shop um, and we organized it together with them. So rather than us rocking up with all our stuff and vegan curry, <laughs> we organized, we chose a day that was it was a Thursday night because the hairdressers in the barber shop opened late that night and we used the chip shop to do the catering. Um, and so people knew about it. We had people coming because they'd heard about it already. Um, and Queenie at the chip shop was running around helping us move trestle tables and handing out free ice cream. And she was, I think she was totally bemused by what we were trying to do there, but she was really happy to get stuck in. Um, so the next slide, please i think uh is what i found out so there's lots of detail in the report of some of the main things and these are i think the biggest headlines for me was the the lack of social and community space was an obvious one um and like i said obviously the the, the shops kind of serve something around that but it you know not exactly and maybe in the future the, the football club may become a venue that is more um of more use to the community also the play park and the field attached to it are actually by report much better used than I anticipated they would be. So people were very positive about those spaces. Um, the So tackling the cost of living crisis, there was a bit of negativity around re replicating some of the initiatives that have happened more centrally. So like share boxes and community fridges. Um, some people you know, the fair froom offer wasn't appropriate for some families. Um, I had spoke to a parent of six children and three of them are neurodiverse and had specific food issues and, you know, and, and actually her angle was, I wouldn't want to take the food from someone else that would need it more. And so, um, and then there was a few people that, uh, someone used the phrase, that green stuff is snobby. <laughs> and so um, it felt, they felt quite separate from the kind of, you know, uh, some of the other initiatives that happen in town. So. Um, the uh, the other thing it was it's a really rich and diverse community that lived there. I think in the very short space of time that I've been spending there, I've met people from Romania and India and Pakistan and Barbados and South Africa and 
China. Um, and there's a really big, like a, a disproportionately high, like a, a high proportion of settled travelers. Um, and some people, I went in having spoken to some of the like housing officers who mentioned that there was a sense of division around that, but actually being on the ground and seeing what was happening in front of us told a bit of a different story. Um, there was a lot more affection and respect between the communities that we witnessed there. Obviously, there's lots of different things that go on, but um, and there's a lot of people there that have lived there all their lives, lots of people that have come back um, who used to live there as children and everything in between. Um, and I think the most important thing that came that I'm sort of coming out with is that there's a real desire to increase connection here, um, either in their immediate neighborhood streets or in the wider neighborhood. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, everyone loved having the tables and chairs outside the shop um, and having that opportunity to come together, um, pe coming out to litter pick. And, and I think really being given the space to say what's important to them. Like I said, Queenie thinks we're bonkers, <laughs> but actually it's really obvious that people are appreciating that as a town council, we're wanting to know what is important to people and making the effort to come and find out. Um, so next steps, I think there's one more slide, um, is so we're at the stage where we've got to know some key people and some key themes. So it's really continuing to build those relationships and follow the energy and support projects as they take shape. So the litter pick that we did last week um, was came out of the chip shop event. So Nikki and I spoke to a lot of people that talked about their sense of pride in the place going downhill and people that were very vocal about saying they'd want to come and join in, although the turnout was smaller than <laughs> yeah, <laughs> played it. But actually the people that were there were really key active people who um, also kind of echoed some enthusiasm that had already happened about maybe beginning a community garden in the area as a place for people to connect and grow food together. Um, we've actually just put in a joint funding bid with Leap Froom and Gardening Together to fund that infrastructure. And because I've got the relationship with the Astor Housing Officer, they are also positive about it and up for us using the land, the Astor owned land to do it. Um, and then, so those are some of the other things that have come up in conversations, jumble trails. Um, there's no notice board in the area. Um, the people that came to the litter pit were like, let's do this regularly. And then a lot of people were interested in either street parties on their street or around the back of the shops, there's um, a, a space that people are interested in having a kind of celebration event. Um, and yeah, and as these things happen, there's more engagement throughout that process. So that will feed back in. So in a bit of a cyclical fashion. Um, and as more residents are pulled into doing things and feeling like they've got more agency and affecting change together in their locality, we can step back and go somewhere else. Uh, I think that's it. That's brilliant, Hannah. Thank you. That was really interesting. <laughs> really good work. Really good work. Are there any questions, first of all, for Anne? Steve? Oh, okay. Uh, for Anne, first of all, just we're going to do them separately. Questions for Anne, Lisa? Uh, just to... Oh. I just wanted to say how lovely it was to hear about all the work that was happening in there. And it was just really heartwarming to hear about the community engagement and, and the difference it's making to that community. So thank you, Hannah. Well, any questions, Steve, did you have? Yeah, um, thanks, Hannah. Just on the door-to-door um, the -door stuff that you did, just as a, as a ballpark, what would you say the sort of potential percentage of engagement that you got from, from knocking on doors was? In terms of percentage of the people that live there, yeah, the they the actually would engage with you, actually have a conversation with you. I've I've got numbers somewhere, but I think it's oh, no, just. <laughs> I mean, I we're I've, talking. Top of your head. Twenty-five, yeah. fifty, seventy-five percent. I've, I've had about forty-five in-depth conversations, right, and about twenty. But this is, I'd have to like add up the hours that is spent. Yeah, from how many houses would that have been? Um, approximately. Gonna say two hundred and fifty doors. Okay. Yeah. That's not bad. It's a guess. I can fifth, find out. About fifth yeah. of households really engaged with that. Yeah, process. that's yeah. That's very good, actually, isn't it? Normal. But and this was during the day, and and over quite a, you know over sort of three months with like yeah two, two hours you know little sessions bits. little bursts. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Interesting. Thank you. And did you have something you wanted to add to that? 
Oh, only that before we move to the recommendations and, and, and the only thing we, we need to vote on is to continue our support for the refugee hub. Um, so if anyone has any questions particularly about that before we move to, to the recommendation. Um, in the report, it says their connections very dependent on personal mobility. And I was just wondering about, I'm trying to now bring back the LC whip because part of that was also obviously looking at the, um, like how accessible all the streets are in the local, that's the local cycling and walking infrastructure plan. And I'm trying to dredge it up from the back of my memory, but I'm fairly certain one of the routes goes out that way. And I was just wondering whether there was any feedback on the accessibility of the routes into town. Specifically from St. John's. Yeah. Um, what I found in terms of people that struggle with accessibility was that there, we, I didn't ask that specific question, but also people that were active were very happy with the connectivity in terms of bus routes and, um, and it was more the people that were confined to wheelchairs or had carers. Um, so I don't know actually is the short answer, but it's people were, when we talked about, oh, would it help if something was more local? There was a general murmuring, but they wouldn't even go to the shop because it's, you know, really challenging for them. So they would be driven or rely on carers to be taking them to places. Yeah, so I think that's something probably to think about in terms of our garden as well, in that case, in terms of the accessibility of it. From memory, it's flat. Uh, it's yeah. flat, but the paths are very narrow and yeah. really wobbly. So there is an easier to... access point from the top near the football yeah so okay. we'd have to look at that yeah yeah okay rachel lenka has a question Lenka. hi yeah it wasn't um a question it was just to add to the presentation there about the st john's area um that that is probably our that's our second largest area that we serve our clients that access all our services um so we do do a number of deliveries to the st john's area fair frame and we do find um, the thing that people like the most is probably food at five. Um, and also we offer the hot meal now with alongside Purple Elephants holiday activities. So because we use, we've used Hayesdown School, we've used the cricket club and we use the football club now. Um, that is, I think families are coming more to those sort of community places and having accessing food that way um, and also just to mention we have previously used Roddenbury Close community rooms I don't know if that might be an option that's quite a good space outside as well so I just wanted to add that yeah thank you I yeah I know the Roddenbury Road um, venue and it's a reasonably sized room there was a little bit of internal politics with the local <laughs> residents about uh, outsiders coming in to use that spot so it might need a bit of work but certainly one worth looking into Okay. Fiona. Refugees bit of it, is that right? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, do we know how many uh displaced people there are in Foom currently? Yeah, we've got the numbers here. So we've got fifty-six families on the Homes for Ukraine scheme, and then we've got another six families that are from uh places other than Ukraine, so Syria, Eritrea, um, Pakistan. At 150 to 200, roughly. So, sorry, come again. In terms of people, number of people. I mean, the yeah, number of people. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah, about 100. No. Any other questions for Nikki or Anne Max? Bits on your thing was about the work between Somerset County Council and the NHS and the establishment of a community hub and all of that kind of stuff. I know that the NHS own what was Shoe Zone and we're intending to do something with that at some point. I know that Somerset are having thoughts about it. I've realised, I remember that one of our kind of goals was to hopefully get them to work together. I know it's a bit revolutionary, but um, that, that might be a good idea. I was wondering, so I'm a bit out of touch with all of that. Can you, have you got any information on what's happening? I have no further information on that, um, other than we're still trying to get them to work together. Um, I don't, did we, did we, right to the nhs i'm sure we did but whether we ever got a meaningful answer does it 
does anyone in the room want to comment on the situation with the old shoe zone shop? So specifically on the, the shoe zone store, the, the, the last we heard, and, uh, and uh, I don't know the, the, the latest as of today, but it was being advertised on the sort of the public assets for sale register. Uh, but that was a, quite a few months ago now. Um, we'll, we'll try and find out sort of the latest on that. So you mean the NHS is trying to sell it? Yes. Good. Yeah. It, 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 they bought it in, sort of in, in the hope that it was going to be the, the ideal place for, for an NHS hub. Um, and it turned out not to be. Yeah. Um, th what we are trying to do is, is, is and I, I was sitting in a meeting with, with um, Kate and Melody today with the commission, the, the adult and child social services commissioners who are also working with the um, ICG um, ab about trying much more to sort of have this kind of um, signposting place, the, 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 a, a community hub of sorts. And they're, they're beginning to, to sort of draw those strands together. But one of the things I found really interesting, because I sort of dipped my toe in it for the first time today, was the, uh, the amazing number of different people commissioning so many different services and trying to draw those, uh, as, as you know, Max, trying to draw those together is, is, is really hard. But we were giving them a kind of a local solution as sort of if, if there is something we can do on a, uh, at a local level, at least there's a point of contact that, that comes with some of those services. And, 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 I, and I think we, you know, we made some really good progress today with them on that. Lisa? Um, I just want to refer back to something that you said before about the, the football club. Um, so that, that sits kind of within that area, doesn't it? I'm wondering if that's a site that might be able to be able to, to be used for, for more community benefit. I mean, we're, we're on the eve of purchasing it as a, as a council, and it seems like it might be a good venue. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I So the only reason I stopped the coffee mornings was because my focus of work was in a very small uh, section of the community and I was, and actually, if anything, it was looking like it might become more popular for a wider audience and I didn't want to spend time doing that because it would distract things. But the um, But in the short time that I was there, there were people that were interested in starting clubs up there and there, you know, it had obvious appeal for being a community venue that would service and actually you know the whole of that side of town struggles for community spaces so i think it would be a welcome venue i just wanted to sort of end end with something if anyone no one else has got any more questions so it, it might might be wise just to sort of say at this point i sort of in this area of work that that kate hallard's given a notice and she's off um and uh just probably going to actually leave in practice probably towards the end of july um formally at the end of august but she's got lots of holiday to take so so sort of for the record if you like thanks for that bombshell <laughs> any other questions for nikki or... oh. sorry sorry guys yeah yes. sorry i just um i should have responded when you were talking paul so i kind of think it would be useful to if you are aware of all of these different strands of commissioning activity across the town to have a record of them because i do think it is the the coordination of those local commissioning initiatives that is something that we could get involved in um either from a town council or from a local community network point of view um because otherwise it's going to be kind of crazy at times of really really um restricted resources for people to be duplicating things and crossing over each other and you know commissioning essentially the same thing when actually they could do it together so whatever you know i would like to know thank you agreed agreed any other questions fiona can i just say this uh, at the last meeting we sort of began speaking about possible changes to the sort of the advisory groups and everything am i taking from this that we're sort of sticking with this is there going to be a conversation because obviously Kate leaving does that change anything I'm just sort of curious as to what sort of happens I'm not saying we should I'm just sort of I just thought we've sort of skirted it a little bit I my my personal feeling is that we 
it would be good if we had like an emergency response team for whatever next crisis comes along because crises always hit the most deprived hardest um so th this group could become rather than the anti-poverty group or we never got around to a good name for it but it, just just like the the idea of pivoting to whatever comes next over the horizon um and and then falling back and then popping up again falling back pop, popping up again but with the chronic deprivation work ongoing so the sort of community resilience essentially okay any other final questions or comments observations before i close the meeting i would like to send oh the vote vote, vote yep. on agreeing the ongoing noting the progress to date and ongoing activity in the above table fiona um and then mark to second and then all those in favor that's unanimous um and i just want to say a big thank you to our town crier who has just resigned um and has performed an amazing town crying set of duties over how many years paul oh, yeah, 15. 17 years so i know he's not here but hopefully he'll see this or hear this and realize that we have appreciated his every cry